So last week was intended <coughs> to be an attempt to make some kind of peace with death by discovering that death is an infinite, constant, and in fact required part of our existence. And thus then to come to a point where celebrating it makes sense. And holidays like Halloween and Dia de las Muertes. So on the other hand, today, I hope to understand death not only <clears throat> as an indelible aspect of life, but a generative, creative producer of life, a seed of life. So I'm not the first to make the claim that death is procreative. In fact, entire religious paradigms have been built on that notion. Flourishing civilizations have based a vast and rich array, array of ritual, and indeed their understanding of being itself, on the recognition of this simple regenerative dynamic that life comes from death. And it seems that civilizations that develop along these lines tend, or at least tended, to be grouped along the equator. So here, uh, society, in its various stages of complexity, emerged in an environment where the primary method of sustenance was foraging, rather than hunting and gathering. In other words, this notion of life coming from death rose to the institutional level in societies whose origin occurred in a land that was just rife with life, sticky and stinky, with life in broad leaves and bright colors, dappled by sun and dew and summertime the year round, where you didn't even have to pick your food, it just fell from the trees. <laughs> So the myths of these folks were based, as the myths of all people are, on their poetic understanding of their natural and political environment. So they noticed that in their environment, life sprung from the carcass of fallen fruit. New fruit from dead fruit. They noticed that life came from death, and rituals were developed based on this understanding. Now, a funny thing happened on the way to the temple. It seems to me, from my supermarket perspective, that generally speaking, the hothouse cultures made two dire, if common, mistakes. <coughs> Watch as I indict entire cultures. <laughs> First, as humans have tended to do throughout history, so this is an easy target, on both a personal and cultural plane, these civilizations mistook the power of recognition for the power of production. Instead of maintaining ritual in order to revel in the beauty of life and their place in it, these cultures instead place themselves in the center of the life process and performed ritual because they thought maintaining that ritual would produce life. They had this beautiful revelation that death produces life all by itself. And then they forgot the all by itself part. <laughs> or got all Frankensteinly <laughs> greedy about it and decided that they needed to be responsible for the continued production of life. So, this is a kind of sacrilege to place oneself in the mechanistic center of what life does all on its own. It's an error of ego on a social scale. So if humans occupy any center, it is the perceptive center, not the mechanistic center. 
After all, we are said to be we are said to be the universe becoming aware of itself, not the universe taking control of itself. And this is important to remember, people. Awareness is not control. So the second mistake, predicated on the first, was that these cultures figured that if the world was to keep going, if the sun was to continue to rise and shine and set in preparation for the night, if babies were to be born and kings were to hold the whole show from slithering back into the caves and grottos, if life were to continue and humans were responsible for that, then death must be induced. And the better the death, the better the life, and so only human death would do. Thus, human sacrifice becomes ritualistically necessary. And now you have a whole society, from the villages of Borneo to the city streets and plazas of Teotihuacan, dependent, dependent on human sacrifice, on murder. And indeed, the Aztecs existed in a state of perpetual war in order to fetch more people to kill. So imagine a civilization, the preeminent civilization on an entire continent that thinks it must engage in war in order to survive. Oh, wait. <laughs> That's a different cut. Imagine such a civilization that doesn't. That's a harder challenge. Not this sermon, but something to think about. So look, there are a couple of things I want to emphasize. I want to highlight this recognition that life comes from death. But I want you to understand something about that that is extremely important. It's not your responsibility. It's yours to experience, not control. In other words, just because this is true, please don't kill anyone. <laughs> That's not how it works. So if you're on your way home from church today and your spouse turns to you and says, what in the name of Pete was preacher trying to tell us? You may reply, he was saying that we shouldn't kill somebody. It's a solid takeaway. <laughs> not impossible to commit to. And not for nothing was it the first of the Ten Commandments. So I'm on pretty solid ground here. But how can we recognize here in the non-Dewey Desert? How can we recognize what the Equatorials recognize, but then not make the mistake of confusing recognition for production, of confusing experience with jurisdiction, of confusing beauty and gratitude with manipulation and power, and of confusing consciousness with control? <coughs> Death makes life. I participate in that principle. But the principle is not mine to maintain. So three points. One, I eat. When I eat an apple, I am not killing the tree. But I eat far more than apples. When I eat a carrot or a cow, I am taking part in the killing of an entire organism. And yet, as the lion and the wildebeest know, I must eat. So here is life from death at the most rudimentary and basic level. <coughs> Two, Walt Whitman. In the Song of Myself, he reports being asked what grass was by a child. And he ruminates in verse on this sum, and then he arrives at the following with regards to grass. And now it seems to me the beautiful uncut hair of grace. Tenderly will I use you, curling grass. It may be you transpire from the breasts of young men. It may be if I had known them, I would have loved them. 
And maybe you are from old people or from the offspring taken soon out of their mother's laps. And here you are the mother's laps. This grass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers, darker than the colorless beards of old men. Dark to come from under the faint red roofs of mouths. Oh, I perceive after all so many uttering tongues. And I perceive that they do not come from the roofs of mouths for nothing. I wish I could translate the hints about the dead, young men and women, <coughs> and the hints about the old men and mothers, and the offspring taken soon out of their laps. What do you think has become of the young and old men, and what do you think has become of the women and children? They are alive and well somewhere. The smallest sprout shows there really is no death. And if ever there was, it led forward life and does not wait at the end to arrest it and ceased the moment life appeared. All goes onward and outward. Nothing collapses, and to die is different from what anyone supposed. And luckier. So reading this reminds me of when we held my Grammy's memorial service in the house in which she died. After the service, my niece asked me, what I thought happened after you die, or where Granny was now. I wanted to reassure her, but also to say, stay true to my own understanding. So, in the most compassionate manner I could muster, I told her that Grammy now has become a part of everything. That she sort of evaporated. And then, therefore, that every time it rains, that was Grammy coming to visit. <laughs> that seemed pastoral to me, which may be a warning to the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> so the rain was Grammy coming to visit. Now, of course, this was a lie. <laughs> and thank goodness my niece stopped listening to me halfway through. <laughs> Whether it was out of skepticism or boredom, I just don't know. She stopped listening. I kept talking. <laughs> to myself, it would seem. So it was a lie in the particulars. But it was also true in a way. And I don't know why the energy of life needs to consume itself or why it thrives in one manifestation only to dwindle. But I do experience the wondrous variability of life, and I would like to do that more and better. I would like to do that better. Third point. Ryan. For a significant while, Ryan was my best friend. I don't know if that was the case when he died, but we were close. And he died like he always said he would. Young. The prophecy and the tragedy mingled. And from this was born legend. Or at least the aura of legend around all things Ryan. And this legend bound those he left behind close together. The legend worked its way into our dispositions and our perspectives, served as a warning and an invitation, and was an avatar in dreams and drinking tales. And we all will die. And the approach of death is in some ways always tragic. <coughs> so prophecy and tragedy will and do ever and always 
mingle. So we are all legendary. We bind to each other those we leave behind. It's true in life, but for some reason it is especially true in death that our legend will work its way into the dispositions and perspectives of those close to us. Our legend will serve as a warning and an invitation and an avatar in dreams and drinking tales. And so your death and the deaths of the dead give birth to whole cultures of psychology. I would call that spiritual. And I might suggest living your life with a notion of the legend you are leaving. The life you are giving to all those near to you. We only know that we are alive insofar as our imagination gives us meaning. We only know <laughs> that we are alive insofar as our imagination gives us meaning. It is better for our imagination to harmonize in some way with the matter or the rhythm within which our life flows. But imagination is the medium of truth and the lens of life. Imagination is also the medium of the spirit world. So beware that it is properly and appropriately harmonized. Beware not to mistake experience for control. And beloved the grass and the air. Beloved the rain and the legends of the ones you love. And live your life knowing it is a legend that will fertilize the souls of those who imagine you. May it be so.